This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chet Chris, London, UK. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 8 of the Internal Economy of Do the Boys Hall. A ride of two hundred and odd miles in severe weather is one of the best softeners of a hard bed that ingenuity can devise. Perhaps it is even a sweetener of dreams, for those which hovered over the rough couch of Nicholas, and whispered their airy nothings in his ear, were of an agreeable and happy kind. He was making his fortune very fast indeed, when the faint glimmer of an expiring candle shone before his eyes, and a voice he had no difficulty in recognising as part and parcel of Mr. Squeers, admonished him that it was time to rise. "'Past seven, Nickleby,' said Mr. Squeers. "'Has morning come already?' asked Nicholas, sitting up in bed. "'Ah, that has it,' replied Squeers, "'and ready iced, too. Now, Nickleby, come, tumble up, will you?' Nicholas needed no further admonition, but tumbled up at once, and proceeded to dress himself by the light of the taper, which Mr. Squeers carried in his hand. "'Here's a pretty go,' said that gentleman. "'The pump's froze.' "'Indeed,' said Nicholas, not much interested in the intelligence. "'Yes,' replied Squeers. "'You can't wash yourself this morning.' "'Not wash myself?' exclaimed Nicholas. "'No, not a bit of it.' rejoined Squeers tartly. "'So you must be content with giving yourself a dry polish till we break the ice in the well, and you can get a bucket full out for the boys. Don't stand staring at me, but do look sharp, will you?' Offering no further observation, Nicholas huddled on his clothes. Squeers, meanwhile, opened the shutters and blew the candle out, when the voice of his amiable consort was heard in the passage, demanding admittance. "'Come in, my love,' said Squeers. Mrs. Squeers came in, still habited in the primitive night-jacket which had displayed the symmetry of her figure on the previous night, and further ornamented with a beaver bonnet of some antiquity, which she wore with much ease and lightness on the top of the nightcap before mentioned. "'Drat the things!' said the lady, opening the cupboard. "'I can't find the school spoon anywhere.' "'Never mind it, my dear,' observed Squeers, in a soothing manner. "'It's of no consequence.' "'No consequence! Why, how you talk!' retorted Mrs. Squeers sharply. "'Isn't it brimstone morning?' "'I forgot, my dear,' rejoined Squeers. "'Yes, it certainly is. Uh, "'We purify the boys' bloods now and then, Nickleby.' "'Purify fiddlesticks' ends,' said his lady. "'Don't think, young man, that we go to the expense of flour and brimstone and molasses just to purify them.' "'because if you think we carry on the business in that way, "'you'll find yourself mistaken, and so I tell you plainly.' Uh, "'My dear,' said Squeers, frowning. <clears throat> "'Oh, nonsense,' rejoined Mrs. Squeers. "'If the young man comes to be a teacher here, "'let him understand at once that we don't want any foolery about the boys. "'They have the brimstone and treacle, "'partly because if they hadn't something or other in the way of medicine, "'they'd be always ailing and giving a world of trouble.' "'and partly because it spoils their appetites "'and comes cheaper than breakfast and dinner. "'So it does them good, and us good, at the same time, "'and that's fair enough, I'm sure.' "'Having given this explanation, "'Mrs. Squeers put her head into the closet "'and instituted a stricter search after the spoon, "'in which Mr. Squeers assisted. "'A few words passed between them while they were thus engaged, "'but as their voices were partially stifled by the cupboard, "'all that Nicholas could distinguish was that Mr. Squeers said what Mrs. Squeers had said was injudicious, and that Mrs. Squeers said what Mr. Squeers said was stuff. A vast deal of searching and rummaging ensued, and it proving fruitless, Smike was called in, and pushed by Mrs. Squeers and boxed by Mr. Squeers, which course of treatment brightening his intellects enabled him to suggest that possibly Mrs. Squeers might have the spoon in her pocket as indeed turned out to be the case. As Mrs. Squeers had previously protested, however, that she was quite certain she had not got it, Smike received another box on the ear for presuming to contradict his mistress, together with the promise of a sound thrashing if he were not more respectful in future, so that he took nothing very advantageous by his motion. 
"'A most invaluable woman, that Nickleby,' said Squeers, when his consort had hurried away, pushing the drudge before her. "'Indeed, sir,' observed Nicholas. "'I don't know her equal,' said Squeers. "'I do not know her equal. "'That woman, Nickleby, is always the same, "'always the same bustling, lively, active, saving creature that you see her now.' Nicholas sighed involuntarily at the thought of the agreeable domestic prospect thus opened to him, but Squeers was fortunately too much occupied with his own reflections to perceive it. "'It's my way to say, when I'm up in London,' continued Squeers, "'that to them boys she's a mother. But she's more than a mother to them. Ten times more. She does things for them boys, Nickleby, that I don't believe half the mothers going would do for their own sons.' "'I should think they would not, sir,' answered Nicholas. Now the fact was that both Mr. and Mrs. Squeers viewed the boys in the light of their proper and natural enemies, or, in other words, they held and considered that their business and profession was to get as much from every boy as could by possibility be screwed out of him. On this point they were both agreed, and behaved in unison accordingly. The only difference between them was— that Mrs. Squeers waged war against the enemy openly and fearlessly, and that Squeers covered his rascality even at home with a spice of his habitual deceit, as if he really had a notion of some day or other being able to take himself in and persuade his own mind that he was a very good fellow. "'But come,' said Squeers, interrupting the progress of some thoughts to this effect in the mind of his usher, "'let's go to the schoolroom, and lend me a hand with my school coat, will you?' Nicholas assisted his master to put on an old fustian shooting-jacket, which he took down from a peg in the passage, and Squeers, arming himself with his cane, led the way across a yard to a door in the rear of the house. "'There,' said the schoolmaster, as they stepped in together, "'this is our shop, Nickleby.' It was such a crowded scene, and there were so many objects to attract attention, that at first Nicholas stared about him really without seeing anything at all. By degrees, however, the place resolved itself into a bare and dirty room, with a couple of windows, whereof a tenth part might be of glass, the remainder being stopped up with old copy-books and paper. There were a couple of long, old, rickety desks, cut and notched and inked and damaged in every possible way, two or three forms, a detached desk for squeers, and another for his assistant. The ceiling was supported like that of a barn by cross-beams and rafters, and the walls were so stained and discoloured that it was impossible to tell whether they had ever been touched with paint or whitewash. But the pupils, the young noblemen! How the last faint traces of hope, the remotest glimmering of any good to be derived from his efforts in this den, faded from the mind of Nicholas as he looked in dismay around! pale and haggard faces, lank and bony figures, children with the countenances of old men, deformities with irons upon their limbs, boys of stunted growth, and others whose long meagre legs would hardly bear their stooping bodies, all crowded on the view together. There were the bleared eye, the hare lip the crooked foot, and every ugliness or distortion that told of unnatural aversion conceived by parents for their offspring, or of young lives which, from the earliest dawn of infancy, had been one horrible endurance of cruelty and neglect. There were little faces which should have been handsome, darkened with the scowl of sullen, dogged suffering. There was childhood with the light of its eye quenched, its beauty gone, and its helplessness alone remaining. There were vicious-faced boys brooding with leaden eyes, like malefactors in a jail. And there were young creatures on whom the sins of their frail parents had descended, weeping even for the mercenary nurses they had known, and lonesome even in their loneliness. With every kindly sympathy and affection blasted in its birth, with every young and healthy feeling flogged and starved down, with every revengeful passion that can fester in swollen hearts, eating its evil way to their core in silence, what an incipient hell was breeding here! And yet this scene, painful as it was, had its grotesque features, which in a less interested observer than Nicholas might have provoked a smile. 
Mrs. Squeers stood at one of the desks, presiding over an immense basin of brimstone and treacle, of which delicious compound she administered a large instalment to each boy in succession, using for the purpose a common wooden spoon, which might have been originally manufactured for some gigantic top, and which widened every young gentleman's mouth considerably. They being all obliged, under heavy corporal penalties, to take in the whole of the bowl at a gasp. In another corner, huddled together for companionship, were the little boys who had arrived on the preceding night, three of them in very large leather breeches, and two in old trousers, a something tighter fit than drawers are usually worn. At no great distance from these was seated the juvenile son and heir of Mr. Squeers, a striking likeness of his father, kicking with great vigour under the hands of Smike, who was fitting upon him a pair of new boots, that bore a most suspicious resemblance to those which the least of the little boys had worn on the journey down, as the little boy himself seemed to think, for he was regarding the appropriation with a look of most rueful amazement. Besides these, there was a long row of boys waiting, with countenances of no pleasant anticipation, to be treacled, and another file, who had just escaped from the infliction, making a variety of wry mouths indicative of anything but satisfaction. The whole were attired in such motley, ill-assorted, extraordinary garments, as would have been irresistibly ridiculous, but for the foul appearance of dirt, disorder, and disease with which they were associated. "'Now,' said Squeers, giving the desk a great rap with his cane, which made half the little boys nearly jump out of their boots, "'is that physicking over?' "'Just over,' said Mrs. Squeers, choking the last boy in her hurry, and tapping the crown of his head with the wooden spoon to restore him. "'Hey, you, Smike, take away now, look sharp!' Smike shuffled out with the basin, and Mrs. Squeers, having called up a little boy with a curly head, and wiped her hands upon it, hurried out after him into a species of wash-house, where there was a small fire and a large kettle, together with a number of little wooden bowls which were arranged upon a board. Into these bowls Mrs. Squeers, assisted by the hungry servant, poured a brown composition which looked like diluted pin-cushions without the covers, and was called porridge. A minute wedge of brown bread was inserted into each bowl, and when they had eaten their porridge by means of the bread, the boys ate the bread itself, and had finished their breakfast. Whereupon Mr. Squeers said in a solemn voice, "'For what we have received, may the Lord make us truly thankful.' and went away to his own. Nicholas distended his stomach with a bowl of porridge, for much the same reason which induces some savages to swallow earth, lest they should be inconveniently hungry when there is nothing to eat. Having further disposed of a slice of bread and butter, allotted to him in virtue of his office, he sat himself down to wait for school-time. He could not but observe how silent and sad the boys all seemed to be, there was none of the noise and clamour of a schoolroom, none of its boisterous play or hearty mirth. The children sat crouching and shivering together, and seemed to lack the spirit to move about. The only pupil who evinced the slightest tendency towards locomotion or playfulness was Master Squeers, and as his chief amusement was to tread upon the other boys' toes in his new boots, his flow of spirits was rather disagreeable than otherwise. After some half-hour's delay, Mr. Squeers reappeared, and the boys took their places and their books, of which latter commodity the average might be about one to eight learners. A few minutes having elapsed, during which Mr. Squeers looked very profound, as if he had a perfect apprehension of what was inside all the books, and could say every word of their contents by heart, if he only chose to take the trouble, that gentleman called up the first class. Obedient to this summons, they arranged themselves in front of the schoolmaster's desk, half a dozen scarecrows, out at knees and elbows, one of whom placed a torn and filthy book beneath his learned eye. "'This is the first class in English spelling and philosophy, Nickleby,' said Squeers, beckoning Nicholas to stand beside him. "'We'll get up a Latin one and hand that over to you. Now then, where's the first boy?' "'Please, sir, he's cleaning the back parlour window.' said the temporary head of the philosophical class. "'So he is, to be sure,' rejoined Squeers. "'We go upon the practical mode of teaching, Nickleby, the regular education system. 
C-L-E-A-N. Clean. Verb. Active. To make bright. To scour. W-I-N. Win. D-E-R. Der. Winder. A casement. When the boy knows this out of a book, he goes and does it. It's just the same principle as the use of the globes. Where's the second boy? Please, sir, he's weeding the garden, replied a small voice. To be sure, said Squeers, by no means disconcerted. So he is. B-O-T, bot, T-I-N, tin, botin, N-E-Y, knee, botiny. Noun substantive, a knowledge of plants. When he's learned that botany means a knowledge of plants, he goes and knows them. That's our system, Nickleby. What do you think of it? It's a very useful one, at any rate, answered Nicholas. I believe you, rejoined Squeers, not remarking the emphasis of his usher. Third boy, what's horse? A beast, sir, replied the boy. So it is, said Squeers. Ain't it, Nickleby? I believe there's no doubt of that, sir, answered Nicholas. Of course there isn't, said Squeers. A horse is a quadruped, and quadruped's Latin for beast, as everybody that's gone through the grammar knows, or else where's the use of having grammars at all? Where indeed, said Nicholas abstractedly. As you're perfect in that, resumed Squeers, turning to the boy, go and look after my horse, and rub him down well, or I'll rub you down. The rest of the class go and draw water up till somebody tells you to leave off, for it's washing day tomorrow, and they want the coppers filled. So saying, he dismissed the first class to their experiments in practical philosophy, and eyed Nicholas with a look half cunning and half doubtful, as if he were not altogether certain what he might think of him by this time. "'That's the way we do it, Nickleby,' he said, after a pause. Nicholas shrugged his shoulders in a manner that was scarcely perceptible, and said he saw it was. "'And a very good way it is, too,' said Squeers. "'Now, just take them fourteen little boys, and hear them some reading. "'Because, you know, you must begin to be useful. "'Idling about here won't do.' Mr. Squeers said this, as if it had suddenly occurred to him either that he must not say too much to his assistant, or that his assistant did not say enough to him in praise of the establishment. The children were arranged in a semicircle round the new master, and he was soon listening to their dull, drawling, hesitating recital of those stories of engrossing interest which are to be found in the more antiquated spelling-books. In this exciting occupation the morning lagged heavily on. At one o'clock, the boys, having previously had their appetites thoroughly taken away by stir-about and potatoes, sat down in the kitchen to some hard salt beef, of which Nicholas was graciously permitted to take his portion to his own solitary desk, to eat it there in peace. After this there was another hour of crouching in the schoolroom, and shivering with cold, and then school began again. It was Mr. Squeers's custom to call the boys together and make a sort of report, after every half-yearly visit to the metropolis, regarding the relations and friends he had seen, the news he had heard, the letters he had brought down, the bills which had been paid, the accounts which had been left unpaid, and so forth. This solemn proceeding always took place in the afternoon of the day succeeding his return, perhaps because the boys acquired strength of mind from the suspense of the morning, or possibly because Mr. Squeers himself acquired greater sternness and inflexibility from certain warm potations in which he was wont to indulge after his early dinner. Be this as it may, the boys were recalled from house, window, garden, stable, and cow-yard, and the school were assembled in full conclave, when Mr. Squeers, with a small bundle of papers in his hand, and Mrs. S. following with a pair of canes, entered the room and proclaimed silence. "'Let any boy speak a word without leave,' said Mr. Squeers mildly, "'and I'll take the skin off his back.' This special proclamation had the desired effect, and a death-like silence immediately prevailed, in the midst of which Mr. Squeers went on to say, "'Boys, I've been to London, and have returned to my family and you as strong and well as ever.' According to half-yearly custom, the boys gave three feeble cheers at this refreshing intelligence. Such cheers! 
sights of extra strength with the chill on. "'I've seen the parents of some boys,' continued Squeers, turning over his papers, "'and they're so glad to hear how their sons are getting on "'that there's no prospect at all of their going away, "'which, of course, is a very pleasant thing to reflect upon for all parties.' Two or three hands went to two or three eyes when Squeers said this, but the greater part of the young gentlemen, having no particular parents to speak of, were wholly uninterested in the thing one way or another. "'I have had disappointments to contend against,' said Squeers, looking very grim. "'Boulder's father was two pound ten short. Where's Boulder?' "'Here he is, please, sir,' rejoined twenty officious voices. "'Boys are very like men, to be sure.' "'Come here, Boulder,' said Squeers. An unhealthy-looking boy, with warts all over his hands, stepped from his place to the master's desk, and raised his eyes imploringly to Squeers's face, his own quite white from the rapid beating of his heart. "'Boulder,' said Squeers, speaking very slowly, for he was considering, as the saying goes, where to have him. "'Boulder,' "'If your father thinks that because—why, what's this, sir?' As Squeers spoke, he caught up the boy's hand by the cuff of his jacket, and surveyed it with an edifying aspect of horror and disgust. "'What do you call this, sir?' demanded the schoolmaster, administering a cut with the cane to expedite the reply. "'I can't help it, indeed, sir,' rejoined the boy, crying. "'They will come.' "'It's the dirty work, I think. At least I don't know what it is, sir, but it's not my fault.' "'Boulder,' said Squeers, tucking up his wristbands and moistening the palm of his right hand to get a good grip of the cane. "'You're an incorrigible young scoundrel, and as the last thrashing did you no good, we must see what another will do towards beating it out of you.' With this, and wholly disregarding a piteous cry for mercy, Mr. Squeers fell upon the boy and caned him soundly not leaving off, indeed, until his arm was tired out. "'There,' said Squeers, when he'd quite done. "'Rub away as hard as you like. You won't rub that off in a hurry. "'Oh, you won't hold that noise, won't you? Put him out, Smike.' The drudge knew better from long experience than to hesitate about obeying, so he bundled the victim out by a side door, and Mr. Squeers perched himself again on his own stool, supported by Mrs. Squeers, who occupied another at his side. "'Now, let us see,' said Squeers. "'A letter for Cobby. Stand up, Cobby.' Another boy stood up and eyed the letter very hard, while Squeers made a mental abstract of the same. "'Oh,' said Squeers, "'Cobby's grandmother is dead, and his uncle John has took to drinking, which is all the news his sister sends, except eighteen pence, which will just pay for that broken square of glass. Mrs. Squeers, my dear, will you take the money?' The worthy lady pocketed the eighteen pence with a most business-like air, and Squeers passed on to the next boy as coolly as possible. "'Greymarsh,' said Squeers, "'he's the next. Stand up, Greymarsh.' Another boy stood up, and the schoolmaster looked over the letter as before. "'Greymarsh's maternal aunt,' said Squeers, when he had possessed himself of the contents, "'is very glad to hear he's so well and happy, and sends her respectful compliments to Mrs. Squeers,' "'and thinks she must be an angel. "'She likewise thinks Mr. Squeers is too good for this world, "'but hopes he may long be spared to carry on the business. "'Would have sent the two pair of stockings as desired, "'but is short of money, so forwards a tract instead, "'and hopes Greymarsh will put his trust in Providence. "'Hopes above all that he will study in everything to please Mr. and Mrs. Squeers, "'and look upon them as his only friends, "'and that he will love Master Squeers.' "'and not object to sleep in five in a bed, which no Christian should.' "'Ah,' said Squeers, folding it up, "'a delightful letter. Very affecting indeed.' It was affecting in one sense, for Greymarsh's maternal aunt was strongly supposed, by her more intimate friends, to be no other than his maternal parent. Squeers, however, without alluding to this part of the story, which would have sounded immoral before boys, proceeded with the business by calling out, "'Mobs!' whereupon another boy rose, and Greymarsh resumed his seat. "'Mobs a stepmother,' said Squeers, "'took to her bed on hearing that he wouldn't eat fat, "'and has been very ill ever since. "'She wishes to know by an early post "'where he expects to go to, "'if he quarrels with his victuals. 
and with what feelings he could turn up his nose at the cow's liver broth after his good master had asked a blessing on it. This was told her in the London newspapers, not by Mr. Squeers, for he's too kind and too good to set anybody against anybody, and it has vexed her so much mobs can't think. She is sorry to find he is discontented, which is sinful and horrid, and hopes Mr. Squeers will flog him into a happier state of mind. With which view, she has also stopped his halfpenny a week pocket money, and given a double-bladed knife with a corkscrew in it to the missionaries, which she had bought on purpose for him. A sulky state of feeling, said Squeers, after a terrible pause, during which he had moistened the palm of his right hand again, won't do. Cheerfulness and contentment must be kept up. Mobs, come to me. Mobs moved slowly towards the desk, rubbing his eyes in anticipation of good cause for doing so, and he soon afterwards retired by the side door with as good cause as a boy need have. Mr. Squeers then proceeded to open a miscellaneous collection of letters, some enclosing money which Mrs. Squeers took care of, and others referring to small articles of apparel as caps and so forth, all of which the same lady stated to be too large or too small, and calculated for nobody but young Squeers, who would appear indeed to have had most accommodating limbs, since everything that came into the school fitted him to a nicety. His head in particular must have been singularly elastic, for hats and caps of all dimensions were alike to him. This business dispatched, a few slovenly lessons were performed, and Squeers retired to his fireside, leaving Nicholas to take care of the boys in the schoolroom, which was very cold, and where a meal of bread and cheese was served out shortly after dark. There was a small stove at that corner of the room which was nearest to the master's desk, and by it Nicholas sat down so depressed and self-degraded by the consciousness of his position, that if death could have come upon him at that time, he would have been almost happy to meet it. The cruelty of which he had been an unwilling witness, the coarse and ruffianly behaviour of Squeers even in his best moods, the filthy place, the sights and sounds about him, all contributed to this state of feeling. But when he recollected that, being there as an assistant, he actually seemed, no matter what unhappy train of circumstances had brought him to that pass, to be the aider and abettor of a system which filled him with honest disgust and indignation, he loathed himself, and felt for the moment as though the mere consciousness of his present situation must through all time to come prevent his raising his head again. But, for the present, his resolve was taken, and the resolution he had formed on the preceding night remained undisturbed. He had written to his mother and sister, announcing the safe conclusion of his journey, and saying as little about Do the Boys Hall, and saying that little as cheerfully as he possibly could. He hoped that by remaining where he was he might do some good even there. At all events, others depended too much on his uncle's favour to admit of his awakening his wrath just then. One reflection disturbed him far more than any selfish considerations arising out of his own position. This was the probable destination of his sister Kate. His uncle had deceived him, and might he not consign her to some miserable place, where her youth and beauty would prove a far greater curse than ugliness and decrepitude? To a caged man, bound hand and foot, this was a terrible idea. But no, he thought, his mother was by. There was the portrait-painter, too, simple enough, but still living in the world, and of it. He was willing to believe that Ralph Nickleby had conceived a personal dislike to himself. Having pretty good reason by this time to reciprocate it, he had no difficulty in arriving at this conclusion and tried to persuade himself that the feeling extended no farther than between them. As he was absorbed in these meditations, he all at once encountered the upturned face of Smike, who was on his knees before the stove, picking a few stray cinders from the hearth, and planting them on the fire. He had paused to steal a look at Nicholas, and when he saw that he was observed, shrunk back, as if expecting a blow. "'You need not fear me,' said Nicholas kindly. "'Are you cold?' "'No.' "'You are shivering.' "'I'm not cold,' replied Smike quickly. 
I'm, I am used to it. There was such an obvious fear of giving offence in his manner, and he was such a timid, broken-spirited creature, that Nicholas could not help exclaiming, "'Poor fellow!' If he had struck the drudge, he would have slunk away without a word. But now he burst into tears. "'Oh, dear! Oh, dear!' he cried, covering his face with his cracked and horny hands. My, my heart will break. It will, it will. Hush, said Nicholas, laying his hand upon his shoulder. Be a man. You are nearly one by years, God help you. By years, cried Smike. Oh, dear, dear, how many of them? How many of them since I was a little child, younger than any that are here now? Where are they all? "'Whom do you speak of?' inquired Nicholas, wishing to rouse the poor half-witted creature to reason. "'Tell me.' "'My friends,' he replied, "'myself, my—oh, what sufferings mine have been!' "'There is always hope,' said Nicholas. He knew not what to say. "'No,' rejoined the other. "'No, none for me.' "'Do you remember the boy that died here?' "'I was not here, you know,' said Nicholas gently. "'But what of him?' "'Why,' replied the youth, drawing closer to his questioner's side, I, "'I was with him at night, and when it was all silent, "'he cried no more for friends he wished to come and sit with him, "'but began to see faces round his bed that came from home. "'He said they smiled.' and talked to him, and he died at last, lifting his head to kiss them. Do you hear? Yes, yes, rejoined Nicholas. What faces will smile on me when I die? cried his companion, shivering. Who will talk to me in those long nights? They cannot come from home. They would frighten me if they did, for I don't know what it is, and shouldn't know them. Pain and fear, pain and fear for me, alive or dead. No hope, no hope. The bell rang to bed, and the boy, subsiding at the sound into his usual listless state, crept away as if anxious to avoid notice. It was with a heavy heart that Nicholas soon afterwards, no, not retired, there was no retirement there, followed to his dirty and crowded dormitory. End of chapter 8